Okay, so um, this talk, uh, well, um, basically, a lot of my default position uh, with building any kind of uh, website, mobile or otherwise, used to be drop in jQuery and get going, because that's my, my starting point with JavaScript. And um, jQuery is now seven years old, and I know jQuery pretty well. Um, and I wanted to kind of ask what, what's beyond jQuery and what, what should we be looking at. And, and also jQuery, for a lot of people, is like a gateway drug into JavaScript. Um, certainly, I, kind of, I, I encourage designers to take jQuery as the route into JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> but that, it's that gateway drug. So how do you kick that habit and kind of uh, uh, lose that library? And, and what are the options available to you? And can we even do that today? So just to kind of bring a bit of context into this, um, like I said, seven, jQuery is seven years old. Um, and seven years ago, uh, this is what I look like, the, the Tash is actually drawn on. Um, but um, seven years ago, I wrote my first, first blog post ever. Um, and it was on, uh, it was a piece of JavaScript that would take the URL and work out which uh, navigation link on the side was supposed to be highlighted to say that this is the, you know, the page that you're on. Um, and it turned 14 lines of code, which wasn't a lot of JavaScript, into three lines of code using jQuery. And selectors, CSS selectors, were right at the core of that. And for me, like I said, seven years ago, that was a huge deal. Um, I introduced jQuery to the, uh, the team of developers I was working with and some of the designers, and they really got, got into it. They understood it. They really grokked it. They, um, they, like I said, the, the CSS entry point is the, is the easy way into jQuery, knowing that you can kind of navigate the DOM just using that. So this, um, uh, this beautiful little bling symbol would give me all that DOM navigation for free, and instead of having to work out, you know, um, how I navigate the DOM in IE6 at the time, or um, you know whatever other browser I was working with, Firefox 2. Um, it meant instead of working with these boring problems and the donkey work, I could be fucking awesome and write, you know, solve the complicated and interesting problems. Basically, um, this is what I, this is what JavaScript programming for me was like in um, uh, 2006, sort of. Um, JavaScript hasn't, I don't think JavaScript's actually changed a lot. Um, I think what jQuery gave me is um, a way of learning the language. And one of the biggest things that jQuery gave me was uh, Ajax Grokage. And Grokage is now a real word. Um, uh, I mean, the, the term jQuery, uh, Ajax was coined in 2005. That, not that long ago. Um, jQuery is around 2006, which meant for me documentation was sparse, particularly around Ajax. The idea of the, the like how it worked was kind of magic to me. And it's still kind of magic to people that I meet nowadays. It's just um, jQuery kind of took that all away from me. I could just say, point to this bit on the server and just make it work. I don't need to know um, how it really works. Um, I didn't have to deal with the XHTML, uh, sorry, XML HTTP request object. Um, I hadn't really seen an on ready event before, let alone know what the different status codes were. Um, and this is what the code. This is, in fact, actually not even as nice as the, the jQuery code. This is the kind of code that um, you'd have to write if you wanted to do Ajax in um, uh, basically IE and any other browser. It's a bit of a mess. Like we're saying, is there the XML, H, the XML HTTP request object? Then check if there's the MSXML2 and so on. Pretty nasty and pretty difficult. Um, and like I said, jQuery just gave me this out of the box, all magic. Um, so it became my utility for pretty much every single project. I would start off with jQuery and work my way up from there. And you know, there's thousands of plugins now. Um, it was definitely my Swiss Army knife at the time. So fast forward to today. My default position now is not include jQuery from the start. Um, and what I want to show you is that uh, jQuery is a tool for a specific job, but there are lots of, uh, lots of native functionality. There's lots of native functionality inside of browsers that can do the same task. Um, and parts of where you might be using jQuery or jQuery-like libraries, you don't need to be using all of jQuery. Or um, There's a lot of cool technology and, and solid technology in browsers today that you should be using. Uh, the biggest one is query select at all. So in those seven years that jQuery was released, and today, 
We now have J, uh, query selector all. I think it was i8 it landed in. Maybe not kind of a, a perfect implementation. But this is what uh, allows jQuery 1, uh, sorry, jQuery 2 to not include the, the big sizzle part. Um, query selector all, you just give it a CSS expression. It navigates the DOM, pulls those DOM nodes out, and you can do stuff with that. That's native to the browser. Um, like I said, the, the, the large part of jQuery 1 is just replicating this for the browsers that didn't have that, IE6 and IE7, um, and the broken parts in IE8. Um, and this is a really beautiful little piece of, well, I think it's beautiful because I'm a geek techie, but um, a really nice, succinct little piece of code that gives me like a little mini dollar function. Um, uh, Adam Lunny of, uh, of PhoneGap and Adobe I had this in a slide somewhere. I saw it and I was like, that's so short and nice. Basically, I've got, I've got my dollar function to go and query the document, um, and I've just added the on event handler. So I can just do dollar some element, some DOM node inside of my document. I can do dot on click to a function, and um, it can handle this touch start. Brilliantly simple. So I took this a little bit further myself and just made this. this uh, this micro library for my own projects. I haven't written this for people to start adopting and replacing jQuery, but the point is this: this little library gives me bits of jQuery, uh, bits of like the dollar function, the on uh, the the trigger, and the um, the on event handler, and it's like 200 bytes. It's a tiny, tiny piece of JavaScript that could be inline to my document, or it's a library that I use. I've used it on a project that I just rec I recently put into production, um, and it's it's super small, but it gives me some of the little bits that I. I'm familiar with from jQuery, but it's not jQuery. It's using native browser technology. So before I talk about when I get rid of jQuery, I wanted to say, I wanted to point out when I do use jQuery in a project. Um, and uh, just to kind of hark back to uh, uh, John's talk, um, I'm, 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 look, I'm looking at using jQuery when the browser doesn't cut the mustard. Um, now this might be for um, prototyping, so a rapid prototype be it desktop or mobile, it doesn't, it doesn't really make any difference, desktop or mobile, to me. It's still the web. Um, so rapid prototyping or where the budget's very small and I just have to knock it out the door very quickly, something that saves me the time or the, maybe the, the, the client knows that their, their audience is IE7. I just drop it in by default. Um, I'm glad that uh, I'm replicating exactly John's slide from a little over an hour ago. Um, but I, Reading the, uh, the BBC article where they talk about you know, uh, detect, uh, whether the browser cuts the mustard, this is a really nice, simple test. Um, in some cases, I, may not include, I wouldn't particularly include the ad event listener in window, but it tells me that query selector all is IE8, local storage is IE8, ad event listener is IE9 and above, but I could, if I wanted to, polyfill ad event listener. Um, there's a link in the slide at the end to, to point to some of these, these polyfills that I talk about. Um, I try with some of my client projects to support um, like n minus one, so the latest browser minus one. If the client doesn't know what their statistics are going to be or they don't have any users in the first place, I'm working with a startup that doesn't have any users in the first place, so we start off with i10 and i9 or the latest browsers. If they know what their browser, if they know what their audience is using, then I have an idea in the first place. Um, so if I know the browser can't cut the mustard and I need to support that browser in the first place, I will give it jQuery. Um, I also uh, use jQuery when the complexity of the application outweighs. Um, like if I find I'm just reinventing the wheel, I talked about this little min.js uh, library that I wrote. If I find I'm re-implementing all the parts of jQuery, I mean, I might actually look, to look at Zepto for a library that um, I would just drop into the project, but if I find that the amount of time I'm spending on coding is just replicating jQuery just to get the job done, then I will stop what I'm doing and switch to using a library. Uh, like I said, I use jQuery for uh, a lot of quick and dirty prototyping. If I want to do a proof of uh, concept, I will just drop it in there, save myself the time. Um, just on um, in, uh, something that, uh, in that kind of quick and dirty prototyping, if you're trying to replicate a problem, um, don't use jQuery to do that. If you're trying to replicate a bug that only happens in a certain type of mobile browser or uh, tablet, you know, I've seen it where someone says, you know, this is a problem, and you can see jQuery in there, and or a JavaScript library, and they're trying to replicate a bug. You need to strip away everything and get right down to kind of raw JavaScript and as little as possible. So. 
going without uh, jQuery, going uh, a little bit naked. So, um, yeah, do I re implement uh, all of uh, jQuery or uh, the JavaScript library? I try and, like I said, I try not to reinvent the wheel. Um, I try and look at what browsers I'm going to support in the first place, and I can make a decision as to which way I'm going to start coding. This is very much like, I'm not, I, I'd love to just stand here and slam down a mic or say, don't use jQuery, slam out the mic and walk off, but it, it's, it's a decision. You have to kind of weigh up uh, what tools you need to use to solve the, the, the problem, basically. I, yeah, that's what I encourage. Um, but the very, very first thing is you don't need document already. You don't need it at all. all right. There's some edge cases, but I'm just going to say you don't need it. You should be including your scripts at the bottom of the document. Okay? So if your scripts are at the very bottom of the document, your DOM is ready when your scripts run. Okay? Um, the reason you're putting your scripts at the bottom is because if you put your scripts in the middle of the page, it blocks the browser from rendering. In most browsers, I think the newer browsers are starting to handle these kind of things. But um, for instance, uh, a few years back, Twitter had their, you know, their Twitter badge, which you put on your website that would you know, show you that you're at the airport eating toast um, on your blog. And I had that on my, uh, on my website, and Twitter would go, be known for going down. Um, and it wouldn't just go down, it would kind of hang. But because I had a script tag right in the top of my document, right in the head of my page, when people came to my blog, the whole page would be blank because it was waiting for the script tag to come back from Twitter. So that script tag was blocking the entire rendering of my blog, remysharp.com, looked like it was down because Twitter was down. I had no relationship with Twitter, just that I included a piece of script. So that's why all my code from that day on goes in the bottom of my, my document. And at that point, the DOM is ready, so you never need this. So the next thing, um, I got a whole bunch of bugbears as well. Um, like the, there's, a, there's a few jQuery uh, uh, methods that you don't need to use, and I see it being used a lot, but I'm going to kind of go through these. Basically, the, the attribute um, property. Now, if you, I learned a lot of what I know through basically poking through the DOM inspectors, so you know, DevTools or Firebug, and just looking at that DOM tab and just looking down the list of properties to see what the values were, what the, property, the, what the keys and values were. Um, and I see this kind of code where it says, um, when this thing's changed, go and get the value and do something with it. Um, but this code should be written like this. Right, it's the same thing, this.value. This is the element that just changed, triggered the change event, and the dot value is a DOM property that gives you the value. You don't ever, ever need the attribute dot value. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, or even the dot VAL method. And this is just, this is JavaScript, this is the DOM. This is there without any JavaScript libraries. Um, fairly common thing to see in some plugins or some, uh, some code is to go and get an element and look up the, uh, the href, when you could just do get attribute href. If you, uh, it's a bit, oh, I don't, my laser thing doesn't work, but it's a bit more text, but it's, you're not going through jQuery's function to go and look up stuff and normalize stuff, and a.href, there's, no there's no function call. Um, you need to make sure you know the difference between get attribute and .href, there is a difference, one of them's an absolute path, and as in the full, um, resolved path and one's the actual string value that's in your markup. But the point is to understand how browsers you know, work and understand just the, uh, the raw DOM nodes and what you can get out of them. I've seen this in other people's code where um, what you're trying to do is say, right, by default, we don't have any JavaScript. We're going to assume there's no JavaScript enabled on this page. And if there is JavaScript, it'll run this line of code. And it, you, know, um, you might have a no script tag. It adds the, uh, that has JS, and it does something funky with it. It styles it differently. We've included j uh, jQuery at the top there. So we've pulled an entire JavaScript library just to find out if it has JavaScript in the first place. This could just as easily be this. Just add the has JS class to your body element. You don't need the script tag at the top. Uh, the actual full JavaScript library, you can just have this, and this will give you the same class in less code, and there's no blocking moment, um, and much, much nicer. And if you want to, if you already have a class on your body tag, you just append it, right? Plus equals. Um, it's not that expensive, and it's, it's, it's not going to, it's, it's not bad, basically. It's better to get rid of all of jQuery at that point in the code. Load jQuery in the end if you really want it, or load something else at the end, but you've got, uh, you know, one nice little piece of JavaScript there. 
So, you know, I mentioned using dot class name, um, but we can go uh, further. There's the class list API in, in uh, HTML5 now. Um, and the project I, I released, I think yesterday, um, I was fortunate because it only had to work in one browser, which I know is a very fortunate position. And some of you do get to work on projects that only have to work in one browser. But I knew that it had class list support, which is the HTML5 way of accessing classes. So this is fine if I'm going to you know, append on uh, the has class. But if I want to remove it, I have to do kind of string, uh, I have to regex to make sure it's in there, then take it out and clean it up. Um, but instead of doing plus equals, I could just do add. OK, this is just regular HTML5. Um, have I got a note about browser support? No, I've got no note about browser support, of course. Um, can I use .js? Uh, can I use .com? We'll give you that, that information. But I'm pretty sure it's in all the latest browsers. Um, if I want to remove a class, just remove. All right? Sweet. Really, really easy. If I want to toggle a class, equally as easy. And this kind of stuff, I mean, I, I do quite wonder how much um, you know, jQuery and uh, Prototype and uh, Dojo actually influence some of these decisions in the uh, in these specs. But this makes uh, class manipulation so much easier than kind of looking for a string and ripping out and so on. If you want to add more than one class, you can just comma separate it as a string. You can't do foo space bar because that will make it messes it up. I can't remember what it does, but it does something weird with it. But you just pass in a um, uh, you know, extra arguments and just keep adding all those classes. You need to be wary of uh, weird things like this. Um, you can do dot .contains and it'll give you true or false, so you can check if a prop, uh, DOM node has a class. Um, but if you give it an empty string, for some reason it gives you a DOM exception, which is kind of weird, but um, you know, it's not the end of the world. You'll, you'll, you'll be using this new stuff and you'll be finding this stuff out. OK, so um, I think PPK had a book quite a while ago that talks about uh, an asteroids game and storing data on the DOM nodes. Um, and uh, there's this, the way that I would normally store data, or normally seven years ago, would store data on a DOM node is just stick it in a class. I would say class equals, you know, score equals 12 or something like that. We have the data list uh, uh, attribute in HTML5. Uh, sorry, data set. So I've got my element, and I do data set dot user equals some string. And it needs to be a string. If we put an object on there, if I just did user, it would turn that into a string, which is a square bracket capital O object, lowercase o object, close square bracket, which is absolutely looking useless. Um, so we do json.stringify to store it as an object, and we get it back out again by just doing .dataset.user. And this updates the, um, if you look at the actual DOM tree for the, for the element, you'll see that it has data-user equals some string. So you can store the score of your, your player or the number of times an asteroid has been exploded or something like that actually on the DOM nodes using this data set. Um, the thing to be wary of, if you're, it, so the reason I include this is because jQuery has a dot data method where you can store arbitrary data against uh, a DOM node. The big difference between uh, this and uh, jQuery is jQuery can store complex objects, i.e. ones with functions inside of it. You can, if you're storing functions, as um, object properties on a DOM node, then you're going to want to use jQuery for that. If you are just storing data like I am about the user, where you can stringify it, basically, if you can do json.stringify, then you can store it using a uh, data set. Oh, no. So there's no support in IE10, of course. Uh, but there is a polyfill. Um, and I should also caveat, if I find that I'm using a polyfill for more and more things in my project, then I'm definitely doing something wrong. If you're using polyfills left, right, and center, you need to reconsider what you're actually doing. If you're using one or maybe two, that's probably the most that you want to be using. Um, if you're finding using polyf polyfills for everything, you probably want to look at a JavaScript library that actually does the job for you in the first place. Um, all right, so like I said, jQuery gave me a, a grockage of, um, of Ajax. But XHR, um, uh, uh, making an a asynchronous request has come a long way in those seven years, and there's some really cool stuff inside of um, the XML HTTP request object. So this is the kind of micro script that I use, again, on a couple of projects recently. I've got this simple function that takes uh, a, a type, so a get or a post. Um, the URL that I want to hit 
and some options and a callback, an optional callback. Um, really nice thing here is I've got xhr.onload. I'm not doing the on ready state dance and is this dot status 200 and is the ready state four or is it three if I want to do? I've just got dot onload, and when the xhr has loaded, it will fire this callback. Um, and I'm making use of uh, dot .bind, which is just part of uh, you know, new, well, not new JavaScript, but it's, it's in there. Um, and it means that I now have functions called get and post, which will basically do get some post to my server. And obviously, this only works with JSON, um, but it's all I need for my project, because I'm not distributing this, this library to thousands of people. My particular problem is solved with a particular um, small code base. It also... By understanding how um, X, uh, the XML HTTP request spec works and understand, looking at the XHR2 spec, you'll get, a, you'll get to see kind of all the new features inside of there. In particular, you've got things like cores, which is relatively easy to implement. So that means you can go cross-domain to do uh, an XHR request. Um, progress events, which has been a long time in waiting. Being able to know you know, how long you have to be able to um, download something from the server, like uh, maybe it's an image. Well, actually, images don't have progress events yet. But upload events, uh, upload progress events. So you've got a file you're sending up to the server, you get a progress event on progress, and it will tell you how much is actually done. Different posting types. You can post um, array buffers to a server. I've not yet had a, a chance to play with that, but it's a different data type. And, and then using form data, which is, a, a, again, another kind of HTML5-esque, it's part of uh, the XHR2 spec, where you can just keep appending stuff into this form data thing, and it will just work out how to encode it. You don't have to use the URI, 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 URI encode methods or URI component encoder. Trying to remember which one you need to use, you can use this form data. Um, so the point here is look at the specs, have a look at what's inside of them. Um, I did try and find a sexy image of forms. That's about as, I got, about as far as I got there, um, just a bunch of paperwork. So when jQuery came out, uh, you know, again, seven years ago, one of the early um, really, really popular and successful JavaScript libraries was form validation. You know, we want form validation in the client side. We want the user to type in you know, their phone number, or um, email address, and we want to go, no, no, you've got about 18 full stops in your email address. You've done it wrong. Um, so we want to put client-side validation to save them doing the full kind of uh, request off to the server. The really important thing to remember is no matter what client-side validation you use, you have to have server-side validation. You have to assume that the user doesn't have JavaScript, and they will hit your server and it will be, you know, the email address can be in the wrong format. You need to be able to send back and say, yeah, this is incorrect. We haven't saved your thing or taken your payment or whatever. Um, you don't need that with HTML5. And in fact, if you do anything based on this talk, when you go back to the office, if you use the jQuery form validation library, delete it and replace it with this. You can just do input type equals email. And those browsers that support the email input type will um, validate what you've put in and, and let it go through if it's an email address. And if it doesn't, it will give uh, the user a little notification to say, this isn't a valid email address. Which means you have your client-side validation in a, lot of, a bunch of new browsers, and the old browsers don't support um, web forms or make it text, and the text will send through to your server, and your server will say, no, that's not a real email address, and come back to the, uh, the, the client. If you want to make it required, you just add an attribute that says required, and now they have to fill out this, this form value. Okay, so really, really simple. You don't need any JavaScript to do this. Um, you know, think of the bytes you're saving. Wherever Jeremy is, he's, he's having a little high five with himself. So, yeah, please like, look at getting rid of your client-side JavaScript validation. Um, if you've got a more complicated pattern, maybe it's just letters and numbers you want to um, uh, allow through. You can use this pattern attribute, and it says only letters and numbers can go through. Um, you can use the same thing. You can use uh, pattern equals 0 to 9, and it will, the uh, mobile phone will give you, you know, a number pad. Um, you've got type equals telephone number, um, well, tell, and a whole bunch of other properties. So uh, do really look at those and get rid of your client-side JavaScript for that validation. 
OK, so next up. Literally, if you Google style, that's what you get. So I figured that was the appropriate image. Um, this should be obvious to everyone, but it, 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 it bears repeating again. CSS is greater than JavaScript. For CSS, I see a lot of people writing JavaScript to do CSS. Uh, a lot of people. I see a lot of code that writes JavaScript to do CSS. Um, I've even, you know, there, there is a JavaScript library that does rounded corners. So that's funny now, but you know, six years ago when your boss was going, I need rounded corners. Um, you get the jQuery library that would insert 50 divs to give you a rounded corner, and you'd have it. Um, beautiful, but don't do it now. Like, if you know someone doing that, hurt them. So, um, using, doing, you know, modifying styles in uh, jQuery, this is the kind of thing you would use, .css. Um, bad, you don't need to um, add CSS inline in your JavaScript. You could just add a class. You can have all your CSS ready in an unused class in your, in your CSS file, and you add a class, and it picks up all those styles. Um, or you could just you know, not even use jQuery at all and do .class name or class list .add. Um, there is one, there's, there's obviously the exception where you've got dynamic styles. If you want to um, apply dynamic styles to a, 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 some a DOM node based on you know, where their application is, you're probably saying, well, I still need to use jQuery to do that. The jQuery documentation says, actually recommends if you're trying to add uh, more than three CSS properties, create a style sheet, inject it into the DOM, and add the class that points to that style sheet. Okay, so they actually recommend that you put a style sheet into the DOM because the browser is really good at styling stuff using just CSS. The, the, the point here is if the browser can do it natively, let the browser do it natively. Anything the browser is really good at, let the browser do it. So on that note, we've got um, set interval versus a request animation frame. And um, again, J so with jQuery 1 and 2 don't use request animation frame. Um, they use set interval for their, for their animations. There is a patch or a plugin that you can use that will switch it to request animation frame, but by default, you're using set interval. Um, so, I was going to try and do an impersonation of Jake, but uh, I don't think it's probably wise with him sat right in the front. Um, I've basically stolen some of Jake's slides to save uh, me pretend, like, trying to pass them off as my own. Um, Jake's got a couple of slides, actually. It points out the difference between... Uh, actually, I think he stole them anyway from someone else, so that's all fine. Um, the difference between set interval and request animation frame. It basically boils down to timing. Eventually, you're going to get this kind of thing happening, where the animation is just going to, like, stutter, uh, to, to use Google's trademarked word, you know, it's going to have jank in it, basically. So you want request animation frame. Um, there's lots of documentation on this, but just take my word for it, request animation frame is greater than set interval. Um, and there's, there's sometimes stuff that you'll need to do to get kind of the, the timing perfect, but um, certainly it performs much better particularly mobile phones. I, again, the project I was working on, when I switched from set interval to, to request animation frame, my uh, frames per second went back up to a normal rate instead of kind of struggling down at the 10 frames per second. Um, and CSS animations uh, run through um, request animations frame scheduling, which, uh, again, is something I stole from Jake. But it means that if you're using CSS animations, it's running through the same native bit of code in the browser to do really good performant animations. Uh, so it makes your site do this. OK, go faster. Um, using uh, the CSS translates also make use of uh, the GPU, which is also going to be nice and smooth and silky, and you'll get your go faster pony stripes. Um, and um, if uh, I'm not 100% sure how well this is supported in mobile phones, and you can kind of bug the Google and BlackBerry people uh, later to ask them, but um, certainly on iOS, everyone should know that using Translate Z will kind of engage the uh, hardware acceleration. It means that if you do Translate X, it will be nice and smooth, rather than doing um, element.style.left, which is not going to be nice and smooth. It'll It'll use the software to do it, basically. Um, and one big thing in uh, jQuery is knowing when an animation has ended, you want to do something with that. So if you're using just pure CSS to do that animation, how do you know when that animation has ended? Well, you have these events that say the animation has ended. 
Um, conveniently, the, uh, the actual unprefixed version is in a slightly different casing, which means if you put a capital E in there, it does not fire. Um, but again, you can use these to basically hook the end of the animation and say, do something with uh, this DOM node. Or in my case, I was taking the class off that actually triggered the animation. Um, so once the, anim the element has stopped the animation, I take the class off and it, 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 it finishes doing its, uh, its animation. Um, there are also plugins for jQuery. If you are hell-bent on using jQuery, there are some plugins that would use request animation frame and convert your, um, your, CSS, your, your dot animate to use CSS animations. Um, from what I can tell, the jQuery animate enhance is like a polyfill sort of for jQuery that will get you, will basically just translate your dot animate methods to use CSS animations. Transit is a, a, a pretty good library for, for doing that stuff as well. As I mentioned plugins, this is something that really um, upsets me. The whole, you know, it's a jQuery plugin just because. Um, I've seen a lot of jQuery plugins. In fact, I wrote a post about how to do something in JavaScript, and one of the first comments was, how do I use it with jQuery? Like, really? Um, so here's three lines to make it work with jQuery. Well done. Um, and I did get a little bit kind of aggro about this. Um, Sorry, my, uh, my mic slipping off my, my sweaty ears. Um, so I got a little bit upset about this, but I figured I might as well put my money where my mouth is. Um, I, I was looking to use uh, this, this fit text um, bit of code. I'd heard about it. I knew that um, I had this little project. I wanted the text to be nice and big, um, and I could grab this, this JavaScript library and it should be able to do the job. And it was for this little micro uh, mobile site that I was doing. And then I remembered it was a jQuery plugin. I was like, fuck, I have to pull in 50k just to get the text to be bigger. Um, so I had a look at the actual JavaScript library, which is this. So it's not a ton of code. And I listed through all the places that it's using jQuery. And um, I decided that I would rewrite the code, basically. Um, so it uses uh, .extend, um, which basically merges two objects and creates a new one. .each, which is a loop. I know how to write loops. Um, dot .width, which is a lot cleverer than, um, than you would expect. It does a lot of stuff, uh, handles a lot of edge cases, a little more complicated than I had anticipated. Dot .css, which we already know, we can just do element.style equals you know, um, font size equals x, and dot .on, which is the event listener, which we can do add event listener. So um, dot .extend for this particular library, and this this walkthrough that I'm going to go through doesn't apply to every single jQuery library. Um, some of this works for JavaScript li for jQuery li plugins. I was just trying to solve this particular problem. Instead of using .extend, since this library only has two options, I could just see if they're being passed in. If they're not, I can just set the defaults. And there's only two values, so it's really easy to do. .each goes from being you know, jQuery.each to a regular for each. And if there's not for each there, I can just do for var i equals naught, you know, i is less than length, and just loop over each one of them. Or I can just do dot for each. And instead of this dot value, I can do, you know, the node that's being passed in. So I've got rid of the, the each. Dot width was a little more difficult. Um, and this, uh, this is something else that I'd like to see from the jQuery project, where they kind of pull out little bits of the library and just kind of put it out there for people to, to use as a standalone library. It'd be really useful to have a little library that gives you the width of any element that didn't require another JavaScript library, because it's the kind of thing that certainly I've come across quite a few times. I just want to get the width of, you know, or the offset of that element in its, in its um, context. So in this case, instead of using dot .width, dot .client width would do the job. This, this is not a straight replacement job. You can't kind of make a note of this and get rid of dot .width in uh, jQuery, but it solved this particular problem when I tested it in the different browsers I needed to support, which included IE8. This worked. Dot .css, like I said, just becomes node.style.fontsize equals you know, x. So I've gotten rid of the dot .css call. And then finally, dot .on becomes event, add event listener resize, and then I call my resizer function. And now I've gotten rid of all of the um, all of the jQuery dependency. I don't need the, the, the JavaScript library. And I've got one tiny library that will do the job that I needed it to do. I didn't need to pull in that dependency. Um, I would like to see 
uh, people who write jQuery plugins, maybe consider kind of enhancing to jQuery plugin. So by default, it doesn't need the library there in the first place. I've seen some libraries that do that, where they have adapters for prototype and uh, jQuery, and they just kind of you add that piece in, and it will then work as a plugin. But it's just JavaScript at the end of the day. It, it, you know, it doesn't need those libraries in the first place for a lot of what it does. Um, so just to recap, um, my aim my aim wasn't so much to tell you to stop using jQuery for, for projects. Hopefully, you're already looking at alternatives when you know that you're kind of working in a mobile environment. I know the BBC had um, j ditched jQuery a while back and switched to, I think, Ender and then Zepto and then eventually gone back to jQuery 2. Um, but the point is to kind of consider the tools that are available to you and what, what environment are you going into. Um, Query Selector All is superb for DOM, uh, DOM navigation. If all you're trying to do is get a DOM node out to add a class to it or change a style, this is all you need. Okay? And a couple of lines of JavaScript, you don't need a big JavaScript library. Think about when you need to use a library in the first place. Don't just drop it in by default. Like I said, quite a few years ago, my default starting point for a project had jQuery in the scripts directory by default. I didn't even need to download it. It was there. Um, nowadays, that JS directory is always empty, and I start building up bits of code. And equally, if you find you're dropping in lots of polyfills or you're rewriting jQuery or rewriting some JavaScript library from the ground up, probably worth just getting the library and you know, thinking about when you need those tools or when you don't. Get rid of document.ready. You don't need it. There are a couple of edge cases. Uh, which I'm sure I'm going to be hassled about later, but um, you don't need it. Just put your scripts at the bottom, get rid of it. This.value, you never need to use this.val or .attr value, just this.value. Get to know the actual DOM nodes, see what properties they have. Um, have a play with class list and um, the data set. Please, please look at Ajax and cores and XHR2 and uploads. Really good spec and really interesting things you can do. I, I love seeing uh, websites where I can just drop, uh, drop uh, Flickr is a good example, dropping images straight into the browser and it's starting to upload them behind the scenes. All that happens with drag and drop in XHR2. Really, actually quite simple to do. There's a good article, I mean, I wrote it, so um, it must be good. Um, good article on HTML5 Doctor about drag and drop in XHR2. Um, Look to CSS for your animations, and certainly look to CSS for the, your, your style switching and use, just using classes to switch that rather than setting different um, properties on the, uh, the style attribute. Um, and maybe consider, if you can, a no jQuery first approach, particularly if you're writing a plugin. Maybe you can kind of help propagate this idea that you don't need to have a JavaScript library there in the first place, and you may write an adapter for that JavaScript library. Um, so that's my, uh, my summary. Um, I'm really not good at advertising anything, but I do need to pimp um, some workshops I'm running on that URL in the UK in July about jQuery. If so, if you don't know jQuery, I can teach it to you, and it completely obliterates my talk here now that I've told you not to use jQuery. But anyway, um, what I wanted to end with was um, I'm probably preaching to the choir, and I think I suspect that a lot of you are going to be quite savvy about the, um, actually a lot of what we're talking about today, um, or a lot of what the speakers are talking about today, which is a good thing, you know, but you guys already invested it. It's your job to evangelize back to uh, the people you work with and to write this stuff up and share your experiments and share your mistakes. And it doesn't have to be talking on a stage, but talk about the things that you're working on with your colleagues and bring them up to speed. Um, it's your turn to, to, to basically preach. So um, I think I'm done. Now I'll leave that link there, that one in the corner. Okay. Five All right. So uh, that was actually a little less controversial, I think, than... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, also, don't use jQuery. It's shit. Yeah, there we Is go. Is that better? No, no, I think that's good. I don't I think believe that's that. Good. That's really bad. Thing and to say. oh, holy crap! We just got like 20 tweets after that remark right there. <laughs> no, so no. Um, so one one thing that did come up from somebody was they they questioned whether um, like why whether JavaScript is really that big of a bottleneck. Um, it's so. It's not quite about that. It's more. Like, like I said, like I said right at the beginning, jQuery is the gateway drug. Um, 
like, some of you started off with Dreamweaver, Dreamweaver I assume, okay, or I'm going to guess. And if you're still at that Dreamweaver, well, I don't think anyone here is still at that same level. I think the people that started off in Dreamweaver have progressed on to learning how to write HTML. That's what that's about. jQuery is that starting point, and understanding what JavaScript can do is that next step. Understanding what happens. doesn't mean you have to get rid of jQuery in your projects, but it's, it's understanding how it works, what you can do, whether you need it, whether you don't. If the project, you know, the, the thing with the has class, uh, has JS, I've seen that, and I've seen people pulling in jQuery just to be able to check that in the first place. And even if you are using jQuery, then stick that at the bottom. You don't need to, to pull it in at the top. It's, it's Hopefully, what my talk is about is there's a world beyond jQuery, and you should definitely get familiar with it so you understand what is available at your fingertips. Um, yeah, and it's it's a little about avoiding the excess too. I mean, right? So the, the example that you said with the 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 has JS thing up at the top. I mean, that's an obvious thing, right? Because it's blocking, it's putting up in the top. That's that's a big no-no. But then, like the fit text thing is another example. If that's all you wanted to do, yeah. a lot of people are just going to reach for the jQuery to go alongside of that plugin, and it's you know it's however many k that you don't actually need. So it's yeah. an excess when you when that's the default. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing lots and lots of stuff, then it doesn't make sense to re like I said, it doesn't make sense to reinvent those, all those wheels. But if it's little pieces, and in my case, it was specific things I want to do. I want to do a little bit of XHR. I want to do a little bit of DOM navigation. I don't need I don't need any JavaScript library to do that. I can write a little bit of code, and I can get myself there. And it's not complicated. There is not there's not a scary world of JavaScript on the other side of jQuery. There's a lot of code there, but it handles a lot of different browsers. Native browser functionality is is really pretty accessible nowadays. And you touched a little bit on, you said especially on for mobile devices, which I think was interesting too, because um, actually that is one case where there is a little bit of a, there is a performance hit. Um, and it's not really, not just the downloading time, but even the parsing time, the time yeah. just to parse the library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's something that I'm, uh, I was talk, again talking to Jeremy uh, during one of the breaks, that I think there's, there's two big, the two bigger issues, I mean, uh, regardless of, uh, well, it, it's the number of times you hit the radio to actually make the HTTP request, so you definitely want to have everything in one file. So if you can have everything in one file, you want to do that so it's one, you're only turning on the radio once to put it down because it's good for the battery's performance. Um, but I've seen in projects I've written where there's enough JavaScript that, I mean, it was a Nexus 7, um, and it took a second to parse the JavaScript, even though it was cached. So my DOM, my DOM ready point wasn't as early as I wanted it to be because it was still taking the time to parse all that JavaScript. And and processing JavaScript is is hard work for um for mobile devices. There, there's a there's an article by um, Stanford University that looked at uh, performance of parsing JavaScript, and that's one of the expensive things that uh, the the browser is doing with regards to the battery. If you've got tons of JavaScript, and it's parsing it all immediately, then um, it's, it's using our battery. I mean, it's using battery when it's processing JavaScript. It's using our battery when it's doing animations and so on. So you just, it, a lot of it, I mean, I'm sure everything everyone's going to be saying is a lot of common sense, but you need, to, you need to be thinking about it the whole time as well. Yeah, there's always trade-offs along with that. Yeah. I mean, if that. And there's, there's the excessive examples. I mean, there are some, I worked on a project where we had to support devices quite a ways back on mobile devices, and just loading J jQuery on the page was enough to kill the browser. Mm. The page, you know, uh, Anna showed the, the screenshot of the console that, you know, choked on the memory limit. We, I, I've run into that on some of the older devices. Just it existing was too much for them. And even on, like, modern, like the iPhone and Android, I know uh, Stoyan Stefanov has done a lot of studies on that, and it's like, mm. what, 200, 300 milliseconds just to parse, even on a modern iOS device, which is a little excessive. Um, but there's trade-offs, right? I mean, the maintainability. So if you're working with a large team, yeah, you know, the framework kind of has some value there. That, that, that does. But I mean, again, you know, going back to BBC, they had Glow beforehand. They had their own JavaScript library, and you know, eventually they did replace it. But it didn't stop them from being productive. Um, I, I might be completely uh, um, disagree with later on, but. Yeah. Uh, Nicola Zakis talks about abstracting away the actual DOM manipulation library in some of his work. He, when he was at Yahoo, he was saying, you know, you drop in um, a library for doing DOM manipulation, but it's not particularly jQuery, it's not YUI, it's just an abstraction of all those libraries, which means that you don't have full access to everything that the library can do. You just get your little sandbox and you play inside that sandbox. It can work within teams. I mean, I'm, I'm working in a very, very small team, so the, the microlibrary that I, I use is absolutely fine. And, well, 
you know, again, BBC were using Ender at one right. point, and then, then Zepto. So, you know, it, it's not that hard for a bigger team to kind of learn a JavaScript library or even agree with a JavaScript library in the first place. I agree. You, know, you get the, the right people one. on board and let yeah. them go. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, last thing then. Um, so, well, I just had a mind blank on that. So maybe that was the last thing, okay. I guess. Um, so thanks, cool. Remy. And then if anybody has any questions, feel free to you know, pull Remy aside afterwards. And if I think of the question, I will call him back up on stage, um, just because I felt like it was an OK one. Thanks. So thanks, Remy. Cool.